billahi minash shaitani rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh welcome back to ramadan reflections today being the 24th day of the blessed month of ramadan for 2023 1444 the islamic calendar now if you were with us yesterday you'll recall that we reviewed verses 8 and 9 of surah al qasas and it featured a look at two women that lived on opposite sides of the river and opposite sides of, of, of life in general. One is the mother of Prophet Musa, and the other side was the wife of the Pharaoh, Asiya bint Muzahim. Two women living polar opposite lives. However, both were given a great status in the Quran and are spoken about very highly by the Quran, by Allah, and what we see within the Hadith literature as well. Now again, once again today, we want to go back to the Qur'an and look at two more verses of the Qur'an which also speak about two women that Allah has mentioned side by side. In this case, we're going to look again at Asiya bint Muzahim, the wife of the Pharaoh. And then immediately thereafter, Allah mentions Maryam bint Imran, Mary, the mother of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon both of them. Now it's true that we've actually spoken about these individuals previously. However, the way which Allah speaks about these two amazing women in these two verses, it really necessitated that we invest a bit more time into better understanding their status as women of unparalleled abilities and qualities. Truly, women that are worthy of being mentioned and recognized in the Noble Quran, not just once or twice, but many times. Now, before we go into the discussion, let, me, let us review these two verses for today's Ramadan reflection, and then we'll come back and do a brief review of them. So Allah says the following, And Allah presents the wife of the Pharaoh as an example for those who believe. She prayed, My Lord, build for me in proximity to you a home in paradise, and keep and save me from the Pharaoh and his conduct, and save me from the wrongdoing people. And also Mary, Maryam, the daughter of Imran, who kept herself chaste in body and soul. So we breathed into it of our spirit and who affirmed the truth of the word of her Lord, his revelations, commandments, promises, warnings to his messengers and his books. And she was of those devoutly obedient to Allah. Now, as we can see, brothers and sisters, Allah began the passage by telling us that these two women are examples for those who believe. Not just women who believe, but both men and women who believe are to take these two women as their role models. God cannot be any more clear in his book that these both, both of these women rather are worthy of us listening and following and emulating their way of life. Now, books of commentary note that when Prophet Musa, peace be upon him, performed his miracles, in the presence of the Pharaoh and his magicians were also there. Asiya was also present, the wife of the Pharaoh. She saw the abilities of Prophet Musa and deep in her heart she accepted him as the Prophet of Allah. And obviously she accepted the one true God, rejecting her husband's claims to being the Rabb and rejecting any other religions she may have followed. Now obviously living in the house of the Pharaoh meant that she needed to practice what we call taqiyya, that is to hide her newfound faith. However, as we know, when you have the deep-seated love for Allah in your heart, no matter how much you try and hide it for your own safety, it has its own way of being shown because you just can't contain the love of Allah. You have to let other people know of it. So when the Pharaoh, Pharaoh, her husband and self-proclaimed God, when he was told that his wife became a believer in Prophet Musa, peace be upon him, and his teachings, he first tried to get her to renounce the teachings, go back to her ways of polytheism or whatever they were worshipping at that time. However, the strong-willed woman refused to give in to her husband's demands. In the end, the Pharaoh decided that, you know, uh, he's had enough and that she and others who thought of following Prophet Musa need to be taught a lesson. And so the books of Tafsir note that she was actually tied down to the ground. Her arms and legs were tied. And she was placed under the scorching sun of Egypt. Not only was she tied, arms and legs stretched forth under the sun, but the books of history mention she had large blocks of stone placed on her chest to torture her to death. 
Imagine the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh does this to his own wife. What will he do to anybody else who believes in Prophet Musa and his revelation? The books of commentary note that as she was going through this excruciating punishment, in the last moments of her life, before she, was, before she died, before she was martyred, she was heard to make a beautiful dua to Allah. In fact, this dua was so beloved by Allah that he actually quotes it verbatim in the first verse that we just mentioned, that we're reviewing for today, in which she said the following, but more importantly than the words are the beauty of the appeal and the way she worded what she worded. The Quran said, as, as a reminder to us, that Allah presents the wife of the Pharaoh as an example for those who believe. She prays to Allah, she makes the dua to Allah, O Lord, my Lord, build for me in proximity to you a house in paradise and keep and save me from the Pharaoh and his conduct and save me from the wrongdoing people. Now, brothers and sisters, pay close attention to what I'm about to say. She does not ask for paradise on its own and a house in paradise in his proximity, in proximity of Allah that is, she asks for Allah to be in proximity to him in a house in paradise. There's a big difference here when what I've just said. O oh Allah, build for me a house in paradise near to you. It's one thing. But no, she says, O oh Allah, build for me in your proximity a house in paradise. She gives proximity to Allah, preferential treatment over the house in paradise. Now imagine this, brothers and sisters, that she's willing to give up the palaces, the mansions, the, you know, the lap of luxury, the servants, and everything of the Pharaoh in exchange for a house in the proximity to Allah in Jannah. She doesn't care about the worldly possessions. She's worried about the heavenly now, for this amazing woman, wealth, power, influence, opulence, it meant nothing if it was out without the one true God, her truly beloved Allah. But she also sought, if you notice, she also sought to distance herself, what we call tabarri or tabarra, from her husband, the Pharaoh, and his despotic actions. She wanted nothing to do with the Pharaoh or what he was doing, his constant, incessant, extreme oppression of the innocent people of Bani Israel. And that's why she makes it into the Quran. The second woman that I want to reflect upon briefly for today in Ramadan Reflections, because we've talked about her previously, is Maryam bint Imran. And more specifically, how Allah speaks about her in this passage. You'll remember, which I just mentioned a few minutes ago at verse number 12. Allah tells us that it was Maryam, the daughter of Imran, that kept herself chaste both in body and soul. So what Allah is saying is that through her self-purification and humility and humbleness before God, that Allah will confer, her, confer upon her something. And Allah confirms that He breathed into her from His Spirit. The Spirit of Allah, brothers and sisters, which uh, was confirmed upon Maryam, peace be upon her, is unique as Allah attributes that to Himself. Just like the Kaaba is called Baytullah, the house of Allah. The Quran is Kitabullah, the book of Allah. The Kaaba becomes more important and the book, the Quran become more important due to who it is attributed to. So in this case, Ruhullah, meaning Prophet Isa alayhi salam, is being attributed to Allah. Not that, it is a, not, not that He is the soul, the spirit of God in the literal, no. In addition to this, Allah tells us that Lady Maryam, peace be upon her, is one who affirmed the truth of her Lord, the truth of the words of her Lord, meaning his revelations, his commandments, his promises, his warnings to his messengers. And he, she confirmed his books. And Allah says she was of those devoutly obedient to Allah. Allah blesses her with a son, brothers and sisters, that would not only become a prophet, a messenger, a nabi, a, ras a rasul, but one of the five Ulul Azam prophets, one of those who has the greatest status with Allah that he has sent to humanity. Now, as I said, we've already spoken about her, about her rather, in one of our past sessions of Ramadan Reflections for this year. You can go back and re-listen to that one or re-watch it if you missed it. 
So I don't want to go into more detail right now today, but I want to conclude our discussion here as we move on in this blessed month of Ramadan. Look how far we've come, brothers and sisters, from day one of Ramadan, in which we're looking at infanticide, insults of women, inheriting women, uh, preventing them from having freedom, what the Jahli Arabs had done to the women of that time, and now look at how Allah is speaking about women in such glowing tributes in this Quran, in multiple instances. And this will only continue for the remaining six or so days of this month of Ramadan and this Ramadan Reflection Series. So as I conclude, you know, I remind you all to join us tomorrow as we turn our attention to one more time to Maryam bint Imran and how Allah considers her as a chosen, purified woman and a paragon of piety. One who is perhaps unmatched in the annals of the Quran other than through her spiritual inheritor, which is Fatima al-Zahra. May God's peace and blessings be upon her, which we will also look at at the end of this month of Ramadan. Until tomorrow, my dear brothers and sisters, wassalamu alaikum jamian wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.